that is, that one strand could serve as the template for another. But skepticism remained, without direct evidence, about whether or not this was the mechanism that cells actually used. This question was addressed by the Meselson and Stahl experiment in 1958. These researchers proposed three mechanisms by which you could get two daughter strands that have the same sequence as the parent. The one shown in the middle here, called conservative, allows you to keep the original double helix intact and you create a new duplicate. That is, you conserve the original double helix and create a new one. In dispersive replication, regions of the original DNA are dispersed throughout two new strands so that there are double-stranded segments of the original DNA in both of the new helices. In semi-conservative, you retain the integrity of the individual strands of the parent double helix, but separation of these strands is paired with synthesis, so you conserve one of the strands from the parent and create a new strand that is paired with it. This mechanism was proposed by Watson and Crick and confirmed by Meselson and Stahl. That is, each individual strand serves as the template for construction of a complementary strand, producing two daughter DNA helices with the same sequence as the parent. This process is complex, so let's step through it. First, it requires multiple proteins. There are lots of steps, and there are important groups of proteins and families of proteins responsible for the replication process. The process itself is important for survival. As an organism grows and cells divide, they replicate their DNA. It's also important for species survival because this DNA is the genetic information that's passed on to successive generations. To protect the information in the DNA, the replication must be accurate. That is, as it's replicated, there must be a very low rate of change in the sequence of bases. Another way to say that is to have a low mutation rate. This is important because changes in the DNA can impact the function of the encoded proteins and therefore the well-being of the organism. And, like I mentioned before, this DNA is the template for reproduction. Even so, mistakes do occur uh, about 1 in 10 to the 9th nucleotides. That is, a DNA that is 10 to the 9th nucleotides long will probably have at least one error. What this says is that mistakes do occur. But mistakes have an upside in that they are opportunities for improvement. A single base pair change in a segment of DNA that encodes a protein might result in enhanced function of that protein, giving the organism an advantage. But on the downside, there are also the potential for deleterious errors. Sometimes a single base pair change might be catastrophic. So mutations do occur, but a, any given mutation might have an upside or a downside. So let's look at the replication process itself. What has to happen first? Well, first, we need the strands to be separated so that we can read the bases and know what the sequence of the complement should be. This is done by a protein called helicase, which uses ATP as an energy source to do it. Recall that in a double helix, the strands are held together by hydrogen bonds between the bases, and that they're stabilized by base stacking. Separating these interactions requires energy. So the separation is coupled to ATP hydrolysis. 
The energy released from ATP hydrolysis is used to drive this reaction forward. As helicase separates the strands, you have single-stranded DNA, which is vulnerable, so it's protected by single-strand DNA binding proteins. Also, as you unwind, you overwind the DNA ahead of the fork. So to relieve the torsion, there's a family of proteins called topoisomerases. There are multiple types of topoisomerases, but their role is to relax the strands back to a normal winding density. There are two strategies that topoisomerases use to do this. One is to break one of the strands of DNA, to pass the intact strand through the breakpoint, and then to reseal the strand. The other uses a break in a DNA strand followed by a rotation around the strands to relieve the unwinding and resealing the breakpoint. The two of these have an equivalent impact, that is, they both release the torsional stress from unwinding. We also see roles for topoisomerases outside of replication. In some cases, DNA can become supercoiled. This drawing depicts a circular piece of DNA supercoiled on the left. Treating that with a topoisomerase relaxes it to circular DNA. Sometimes DNA is formed where two circular pieces of DNA pass through each other. These are called catenated rings. Treating these with topoisomerases can allow the rings to become separated from each other. On the right, you can see the structure of topoisomerase surrounding DNA, protecting DNA during the process. This is important because a mistake in topoisomerase results in a break in DNA. So a substantial part of this protein, of its structure, stabilizes DNA during this process. What problems do you see that can come from the separation of strands that's required for the replication process? Think back to how the cell addresses these issues. Can you think of alternative ways to address the impacts of separating the strands?